Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on The Sundowners, 1960. I've always liked this movie because it had Robert Mitchum playing a manly, manly man from Down Under, and most of the big stars are not Australian. This movie has a 7.1 rating on imdb.com. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film has a 75% on the tomato meter and 63% audience approval. This film was nominated for five Oscars. Best Picture, Fred Zinneman. Best Actress in a Leading Role, Deborah Carr. Best Actress in a Supporting Role, Glynis Johns. Best Director, Fred Zinneman. And Best Writing Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium, Isabel Lenart. It was the only Best Picture nominee that didn't win in any category. Deborah Carr said in her autobiography, titled Deborah Carr, Not Just an English Rose, and published in 1986, that she should have won, this being her sixth and final unsuccessful nomination for Best Actress. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers said in a December 9, 1960 review, quote, What is more, the migrants in this instant are not hard-bitten bags of skin and bones, working wearily around the sheep ranches without purpose, ambition, or hope. They are fat, Sassy, bolsterous, cheerful people given to gambling, beer drinking, singing songs, and generally raising mischief when they are not tending to their jobs. There's the husband, as sweet and nice a fellow as Robert Mitchum has ever put upon the screen. Oh, he may be stubborn and sometimes thoughtless, but he's the salt of the earth. There's his wife, a loyal, patient woman, wistfully longing for a permanent home, but resigned to the wanderlust of her husband. She's an angel. Why not? She's Deborah Carr. There's the son, a bright-eyed, spirited youngster, attractively torn between the blithe vagabondness of the old man and the mother's desire to settle down. He's played by Michael Anderson Jr. with the right blend of tenderness and spunk. And there's the grand vagabond they encounter and absorb into their migrant menage, a bland, bearded, bruning, nagging bachelor played brightly by Peter Ustinoff and the bright, bouncy barmaid, innkeeper played richly by Glennis Johns, unquote. Actors. The great actor, Robert Mitchum, played the itinerant sheep shearer, Patty Carmody. Mitchum was first covered in the film noir Out of the Past, 1947. Often paired with Mitchum, Deborah Carr was cast as the longing and sweet Ida Carmody. Kerr was first covered in the war-torn love story From Here to Eternity, 1953. Michael Anderson Jr. is pretty good as a young man reaching maturity, Sean Carmody. This actor was first covered in the Custer knockoff, The Glory Guys, 1965. Peter Ustinoff, as always, was over the top and fabulous, this time in his role as rogue Rupert Vinegar. Ustinoff was first covered in the classic sci-fi Logan's Run, 1976. Glennis Johns was cast in the role of Mrs. Firth. Johns is known as the woman with the upside down eyes, unquote, and that's not an insult based on the shape of her beautiful eyes. She was born in 1923 in South Africa. Johns was born while her parents were on tour, as her father was an actor and her mother was a concert pianist. In 1935, Johns began working as a child ballerina. This led to her being cast in another show at the Old Vic. Johns continued to dance on stage and later became a ballerina instructor. Johns began working in film in 1938. She had minor roles in South Riding, 1938, Murder in the Family, 1938, Prison Without Bars, 1939, On the Night of the Fire, 1940, The Briggs Family, 1940, and 49th Parallel, 1941. She also continued to work on stage. Johns was becoming better known by the time she was in The Adventures of Tartu, 1943, The Halfway House, 1944, which also featured her father. Perfect Strangers, 1945, This Man is Mine, 1946, Frida, 1947, and An Ideal Husband, 1947. Johns played the leading role, Miranda, 1948, as The Mermaid. Third Time Lucky, 1949, Dear Mrs. Prohack, 1949, and State Secret, 1950. Johns gained more significant roles in the films such as Flesh and Blood, 1951, the excellent aviation film No Highway in the Sky, 1961, Appointment with Venus, 1951, and The Card, 1952. This was the time that Johns came onto my radar with films like The Sword and the Rose, 1953, 
Rob Roy, The Highland Rogue, 1953. Personal Affairs, 1953. The Seekers, 1954. The Beachcombers, 1954. Mad About Men, 1954. A sequel to Miranda, the absolutely hilarious The Court Jester, 1956, co-starring Angela Lansbury. The vessel with the pestle. What about the palace from the chalice? Not the palace from the chalice, the chalice from the palace. Where's the pellet with the poison? In the vessel with the pestle. Don't you see? The pellet with the poison's in the vessel with the pestle. The chalice from the palace has the brew that is true. Around the World in 80 Days, 1956. The Sundowners, 1960, along with her father. And Mary Poppins, 1964 where she played the voting rights obsessed mother. In 1967, she played one of only five guest villains on Batman 1966-68 as Lady Penelope Pisu. Later films include While You Were Sleeping 1995 and Superstar 1999. If you want to support the show, follow the links below to our merch store where you can get shirts like this, lots of other designs, buttons, or cups like these. Thank you for your support. Story. A wagon travels down a dusty road in Australia as the credits roll. The wagon is driven by Patty, Robert Mitchum, his wife Ida, Deborah Carr, and their teenage son, Sean, Michael Anderson Jr., are on board. They are heading towards the dusty town of Bulinga. The family camps by a river. As Ida hauls water, Patty complains about how little money they have. Patty watches Ida undress. The pair is deeply in love. In the morning... Ida cooks and washes clothes by the campfire. Sean looks at a farm across the river that is for sale. Ida likes it, and Patty tells him everything wrong with the farm. Patty makes a case for living the life of a rover or a sundowner. Patty takes the wagon horse into the town to find out about a job. Ida reminds him he may need another horse, and Patty says he may take on another drover. Sean goes hunting for rabbits. Patty is late coming back, and Ida knows he's in a pub somewhere. Sean is about to shoot a rabbit when the dog attacks a man. The man starts to hit the dog with a buggy whip, and Sean threatens to shoot the man. The man is Rupert Vinegar, Peter Ustinov. He is working as a laborer for a widow on a farm. Sean tells that his father is looking for a job moving sheep. Rupert gives Sean a lift into town. He likes the boy's spunk. Patty is drinking and singing in the pub of the dirt road town. Rupert goes into one pub, and Sean goes into the other to retrieve his father. Patty is very popular in the pub. Patty sends Sean back to the camp. Rupert complains about the singing in the pub. Rupert goes into the pub and knocks Patty unconscious. When Rupert comes out carrying Patty, the dog attacks him again. Some men comment that Rupert's father is a lord. Rupert loads Patty into the wagon. Sean gets the dog to release Rupert. By the time Patty is loaded, the law has come, and people think the dog has rabies. In the morning, Patty is hung over. Ida wakes him and he hears Rupert outside. Ida says the drover that Patty hired is ready to work. Patty tries to unhire Rupert, but Ida stands up for him. Rupert has several horses with him. They pick up a mob of 1,200 sheep that they are to herd to Quandilla. He will be paid for the number of sheep he delivers. Patty tries to get Rupert to get rid of a captain's hat he's wearing. To be a drover, look like a drover. You get rid of that silly flaming hat. Let me tell you about this silly flaming hat, my good man. Yeah. And don't call me that. I'm not your good man. What would you prefer, boss? Rupert explains that the hat was his when he was in the China Sea trade. The dogs do a lot of the work as the men crack whips and shout. A long montage of sheep and local animals is shown. The group makes camp and pins the sheep for the night. Sean talks to Rupert about life and the world. Rupert has been a sea captain and he has also been in the Lancers, but he was cashiered out. The days pass with work, like chasing dingoes away and many dusty miles. They stop at a farm, and the couple allows them to stay. The family eats inside. The young daughter flirts with Sean. Since the farmer used to be a drover, Ida begins to think seriously about having a home. Patty puts the conversation off until another time. One day on the journey, they see a wildfire burning in the distance. They send Ida ahead to the river, while the three men try to speed up the sheep. As the fire gets closer, Patty sends Sean to find his mother. The fire drives kangaroos into the sheep and the herd begins to break up. Patty risks his own life to save as many of the valuable sheep as possible. Rupert heads into the smoke looking for Patty. Ida and Sean finally see the herd coming out of the smoke at the river. Rupert and the dog are pushing the herd and Patty is still missing. In the fire, Patty forces his horse into a stream where they can avoid being burned. 
Ida takes Rupert's horse and heads back to look for Patty. Fearing the worst, Ida finds her husband and his horse. They are safe. The group gets the sheep herded into Condilla. Ida looks with envy at a wealthy lady sitting on a train. Patty gets paid and is ready to head on to Queensland. The entire group goes to a good hotel with a bar. The clerk is Mrs. Firth, Glendis Johns. Miss Firth comes out, talking a mile a minute, and is happy to see another woman. She and Rupert flirt a little. Since it is the end of the job, Rupert offers to buy Patty a drink. They fight about who should pay. Ida and Sean go take a bath. Later, Ida and Sean see that sheep shearers are coming from all over, and the idea of staying in one place is brought up again. Ida thinks the family can make enough money for a down payment on the farm in Bulinga. The adults sing around the piano, and Mrs. Firth dances with Rupert. Patty invites Rupert to come to Queensland with the family. Rupert says he is interested in staying around to see what happens. Early in the morning, Ida talks about getting local jobs. Rupert said that Mrs. Firth got too serious that he had to flee. Against Patty's wishes, she gets Rupert a roller job, Patty a job as a shearer, and Sean as a tar boy, and her as the camp cook. Bluey Brown, John Mellon, speaks for Ida when some of the other men want a male cook. Once Ida cooks for the group, they are all set. The workers head out to the station named Waddle Run. On the way, they almost crash into another truck carrying workers from another camp. When Ochre, Ronald Frazier, smarts off, a Donnybrook breaks out. All the men from both camps fighting. When it's over, the men all load back into the trucks, laughing about the good fight they've had. The single males live in a bunkhouse. Ida and Patty live in their tent, but she has a house where she can do the cooking. The sheep shearing equipment is powered by a generator. The men start shearing, and it's quite an exciting process. The number of sheep sheared is recorded on a board, and giant pride is taken in being the best. Ida is delighted to stay in one place for a while. She gets a visit from the ranch owner's wife, Mrs. Halstead. The ladies bond pretty well over the lonely life they live. That night, Ida gives Patty sore back a rub. Ida keeps a tight handle on the money, wanting to amass the down payment for the farm. Rupert goes to see Mrs. Firth. Bluey's pregnant wife, Liz, arrives, so they have another woman at the station. Bluey comes running when he finds out his wife is there. There's only one doctor for 500 square miles. One day, Ida gets a letter from the farmers they stayed with. The men talk about their dreams and life after shearing. That morning, Patty stays late. He invites her to town on Saturday night. Rupert comes dragging in after spending the night with Mrs. Firth. Apparently, he spent the night many times before. During a tea break, Rupert suggests they set up a shearing contest with another station to make extra money gambling. Patty is the champion shearer, so he will represent their station. Patty comes for his date on Saturday night with Ida, and she is not ready. She doesn't want to leave Liz behind in case the baby comes. But Bluey, her husband, goes drinking with the men in town. At Ida's insistence, Patty goes along also. In the bar, Patty is distant, and he is thinking about his wife's wishes. Rupert arrives at the bar and flirts with Mrs. Firth. Oh, Blue, those Duke's daughters must miss you. Oh, the Duke's daughters. They haven't heard half the things I want to say to you, but not here. And can't we go? Oh, I can't leave the tail rope, not yet. Well, have I come to this? A cash register as a rival? <laughs> the mayor of Quandilla, Mervyn Johns, the actual father of Glennis Johns in real life, comes into the bar. They had had some kind of relationship in the past, but he has been replaced by Rupert. Patty buys a beer for Sean. Bluey's wife goes into labor, and the doctor is 20 miles away. Ida calls trying to get the men to come back, but a drunk answers the phone and hangs up. Mrs. Halstead drives to town to retrieve Bluey. She finds Bluey passed out on the floor. Patty rousts the drunk, and the group heads back to the station. Mrs. Halstead gets back, but the doctor never makes it. She goes in to help with the birth process. Ida is indignant when she sees Sean is drunk. Ida slaps Patty. The two older women work with Liz as she struggles through the birth of a baby boy. In the morning, Ida and Patty make up about their fight. Patty tells her that they have been on the station for six weeks and he is ready to move on. Ida insists that they need the money to buy the farm for their futures. He says he is leaving on Saturday with or without the family. On the way out, Patty is told that the shearing contest is on for Saturday. He says he's not going to participate. The best insult thrown is that he is a dirty dingo. Sean runs to his mother and is told that Patty is leaving on Saturday. Sean goes to see his dad in the tent. 
He tells his father that he thinks he is also a dirty dingo for wanting to run out on the family. The group of men come to see Patty. Rupert says the money they raise in the competition will be used for Bluey's baby. Patty agrees to compete. Mrs. Firth invites the group to a party on Sunday. Patty tells Ida and Sean that he will stay until the end of the season. On the day of the competition, the men from both stations make heavy side bets. The other station brings in a little old man named Johnson. Johnson has no teeth and a wooden leg. He says he is the worst shearer at the station. The contest stays even for a time. During the first break, Patty is showing signs of being worn out. Johnson is relaxed and smoking his pipe. The two men are even at the lunch break, but Patty can't stand up by himself. Johnson comes outside smoking and laughing. Johnson soundly beats Patty at the end. The men are disappointed with Patty's performance. In Ida's letter, she is told that the farm in Belinga is still for sale at 2,000 pounds. She thinks they will have 400 pounds at the end of the season, which will be the down payment. The men from both camps have a great time at the bar. Ida asks for help cooking, and all the men run outside to play a coin flipping game. Mrs. First stands for the men, saying they work hard and need to play. A drover comes in with a herd. Patty sees a horse the man has with him and is quite struck by the animal. Patty borrows some money from Sean and wins a couple of hundred pounds. He bets the money against the drover and wins the horse. Sean begins riding the horse and the pair are swift. Patty plans to race the horse on local tracks and make money as they travel. Rupert says he will help Sean with the training. Sean and Ida convince Patty to go to the racetrack at Bulinga. They decide to name the horse Sundowner, a term for the itinerant lifestyle. Rupert drags in one morning and says he is going to leave Mrs. Firth behind. Although she thinks he should stay with Mrs. Firth, Ida says he is welcome to come to Bulinga with them. Finally, the season ends and everyone has to say their sad farewells. Mrs. Firth is unfazed by Rupert leaving. The group makes it to a rural racetrack. Sean is riding Sundowner and easily wins the race. The group makes it back to Bulinga. The farming couple tells them to camp on the for sale farm. This is the first time Patty learns that Ida has been working in the background to acquire the farm. Ida is ready to move in, but Patty wants nothing to do with it. Ida tells him she has the down payment and wants to bet some money on Sundowner at the Belinga Cup race. Ida gives Patty 50 pounds to bet on Sundowner. Patty returns late in the night. He has lost the 50 pounds and given an IOU for the rest of the money in their jar. With the bunny gone, the group of four leave the farm in the morning. Sean and Ida are mad at Patty. Rupert offers to lend 100 pounds, but Patty refuses. Ida gives the money in the jar to Patty. They also discuss selling Sundowner after the race. They go to the race, and the prize for winning is 50 pounds. Sean gets a really late start in the race because Sundowner is acting up. Before long, he catches the pack and eventually takes the lead. Sean wins the race by a neck. The group has won 200 pounds in the race, and Patty has already sold Sundowner for another 200. They will have enough money to make the down payment. Ida doesn't want Patty to sell the horse. An announcement of a protest is made. With minimal due process, Sundowner has been disqualified for interference. Local rat bastards. Ida breaks into loud laughter as she realizes her dream is not coming true. The other three soon join in. The horse buyer comes and offers only 25 pounds. Mostly Ida rudely sends him away. The group of four and the horse Sundowner head away to continue their nomadic life. If you like what you saw, be sure and crush that like button. Conclusions. To save money, Jack Warner wanted to shoot this movie in Arizona, but director Zinneman convinced him to shoot in Australia. The movie scenery is epic, and it would be just another film without the harsh landscape. The most common use of the term sundowner does not represent hardworking people like these shown in the movie. Typically, a sundowner will arrive at the end of the workday, sundown, and ask for a meal. Their goal is to leave early in the morning before any work begins. Robert Mitchum was the third actor selected for the role of Patty. First was Gary Cooper, but he was too ill to take the job. Next was Errol Flynn, but Flynn died before the film could start. He would have been fantastic as the slightly undomesticated Patty. Mitchum was excited to do the movie so he could work with his friend Deborah Carr. They became friends when they were making Heaven Knows Mrs. Allison 1957, where Carr was a nun and Mitchum was a Marine, both of whom were caught behind Japanese lines during World War II. Finally, the for sale farm at Bulinga 
was actually on the Snowy River. So give the man from Snowy River 1982 another look. World famous short summary, don't gamble with locals. You can drop over to my site at classicmoviereb.com. There's lots of movies over there and a lot of information, especially about film noir. You can click on the box up here or here to get a recommendation for another episode which you might like. Beware the Moors.